Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We are so glad you're here this morning. If you are a first-time visitor, we especially appreciate you being here with us. And we invite everyone, there's a friendship register at the end of the pew. We invite everyone to sign in on that so that we can have a record of who attended worship this day. So we'd appreciate that. We welcome today in our pulpit is Mr. Sammy Sibbett. A lot of you know Sammy. You grew up with him. You know that he's a businessman here in town. Um, his wife, Cheryl, is with us today also. Cheryl, we're glad that you're with us. They have three children and three grandchildren. You don't look old enough to have grandchildren, but, but congratulations. <laughs> and uh, so we are so glad that you are here. Sammy is a deacon at First Baptist Chadburn, and in the last few months, year, he has found a new calling in life concerning his relationship with God, and um, he is in the process of being ordained to the ministry, and uh, just know that we will be praying with you on your journey as, on the way as we go. So, We have a few announcements on the back of the bulletin that schedule events, activities, you know most of them, but if you will look at that and then let me bring out a couple that may not be there. Next Sunday, not only being Mother's Day, is Youth Sunday. And our youth today will be rehearsing for that service starting at 3.30. There'll be youth rehearsal for worship. There will be handbells rehearsal for worship next Sunday and youth choir rehearsal for next Sunday. So they're going to be a busy group this afternoon. And then last, I would like to mention to you that next Saturday here at 3 o'clock, there will be a memorial service for Kirk Wayne. And everyone is invited afterwards to go to a reception at the Shepton Frog Restaurant. So just be aware of that. It's May 11th, 3 o'clock, Kirk Wayne Memorial. We begin our worship service with a moment of silence. Let us do that, and then we will move into our worship time. Amen.
Let us pray. God of grace, God of glory, you have given us minds to know you. You have given us hearts to love you. And you have given us voices to sing your praise. This day, fill us with your spirit so that we can do these things that honor and glorify you. And help us to worship you in the fullness of truth and the fullness of your spirit. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Revelation 5, 11 through 14. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea and everything in them say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Thank you. In response to that scripture, turn to 218. Tis the church triumphant singing. We will sing stanzas one, two, and four. Remain seated, please.
I'll be reading Acts 9, 1 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for the letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Thank you. We have all had experiences, maybe not as profound as Paul. We might not have seen a bright light. We not, might not have been blinded. But our experience with God and becoming closer to Him and transforming He does to our life is just as powerful. Each of us have that message to proclaim. 589 Ye servants of God, your master proclaim. This is the offertory hymn. Would you stand as we sing together?
morning, everyone. I'd like to read a short passage before we give our offertory prayer. Please bear with me a few moments with this. Every so often, we hear in the news that someone has made a large donation to a hospital, school, or some other worthy institution and make it possible for them to serve their communities. Many of us are not able to make those large gifts yet. Whatever the size of our gift, in the eyes of God, it can be a great gift. Hear these encouraging words. But it is not the greatness of the gift that makes the offering acceptable to God. It is the purpose of the heart, the spirit of gratitude, and the love it expresses. Let not the poor feel that their gifts are so small to be unworthy of notice. Today, our offering is for our church and its missions. Let us give it with a spirit of gratitude and love in our heart. If we give with such an attitude, God will bless both the giver and the congregation. Please join me in our prayer. Help us to be generous givers, dear Lord, both of our money and our lives, that we might make a difference in our church and community. We ask this through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave all that he was that we may know life in all its fullness. Amen.
children are elsewhere this morning, so we will move on into the pastoral prayer time. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we rejoice with you in your creation. All that you have made, all that you have created, you have done so with love. You have given us so much. You've given us great things individually, but also as a church, as a community. We lift both up to you this day, our church, and all that it is and all that it will be in the future. We lift it up to you, Father, and each member that is here, whatever burdens they may be carrying, whatever health issues they are bearing, we lift them up to you because we know that you are our sustainer and that you are our great creator. Lord God, we pray for the world this day and all that is taking place. We ask that you especially be with the nations who are victims of persecution, threats of war, violence of all types. We lift these nations up to you as well as our own nation, that we will look to you as our God, the God that is of love, the God that is of peace, that passeth all understanding. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Eddie, for that warm welcome, and everyone that has welcomed me and my wife today. Um, what a wonderful church. What wonderful singing. Just a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, Cheryl and I were able to come visit a few years ago, and 
my goodness, after we had left, after we experienced the worship service, y'all would blush because we loved it so much. We were so excited. It made us have thoughts. We just loved everything. We left, loved everybody. It was so welcoming, and it was so wonderful. And it is an honor to be here today to speak with y'all. And it is a very, very unlikely journey that I would be up here speaking today to anyone. And I don't have time to go through the whole journey, but one part of the journey along the way, somewhere around five years ago, my pastor at the time, Dr. Danny Russell, invited me to go to the CBF conference. And it sounded terrible. It sounded boring. It sounded, I didn't want to go. Gosh, just sounded, but I loved Danny though, and he was so exuberant about it, and uh, he'd asked some other folks, and everybody had sold him out. So I was going to be the good friend, like I've got a few here today, and I was going to go with Danny and turn, come to find out it is fun. Uh, my home church, as many of you may know, is Chabron Baptist Church, and we are brothers, sister churches, if you would. We're both CBF churches, and it's such a wonderful thing to be a part of the CBF. Um, I was experienced, I experienced many things at the conference that I had not been privy to before. As I said, it was fun, really enjoyed it, but it also exposed me to a bigger Jesus, a bigger world. I had been guilty of being in my own little church for a while and not realizing the needs outside of my own church. And I started to be made aware of the many challenges that church, not this church, not my church, but Jesus' church faces today. Many, many challenges. Jesus is actually doing fine. It is the church that is struggling. So, since that time, I have been reading books. I've been listening things on the internet, listening to sermons, talking to friends, making new friends that are pastors, trying to explore these challenges of what the church faces moving forward. And the answers, are they difficult, complicated, or are they simple? Today, I would like to talk to you about another highly unlikely journey of a gentleman named Simon or Simon Peter or Peter or Simon son of John or Simon son of Jonah, many names. But today, I would like to start by reading a passage of the living word of God in Matthew and it's chapter 16. Verses 18, I know you're, it's 18 and 19, I'm going to read. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. May God bless the reading of his living word. So, I'd like for us to turn back the clock a little bit if we can. I'm going to ask you to use your imaginations for a moment. You know, we're just coming off the end of celebrating the season of Lent. And two weeks ago was Easter. So many of the events leading up this time are fresh on our mind. And I'd like for us to really, if we can, go back in time to examine the life of of Simon. Let's take off our shoes and let's put his on, the dirty sandals. Let's examine his life of an ordinary man that was a fisherman. Now, many people get excited when they hear fisherman because many people claim to be fishermen. And I've even seen a bumper sticker that says, fish or die, jokingly, right? However, this would have probably been Simon's bumper sticker because literally he needed to catch fish to survive, not only to eat, provide for his family. He needed the fish. There was no catch and release. It wasn't for sport. 
He needed to catch fish. And as we journey back in time to his time before he met Jesus, an unlikely journey began as this fisherman on this particular day was not having much luck fishing. And he was <clears throat> introduced to Jesus. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus went out fishing and told him famously to cast your nets over there. And of course, he caught a multitude of fish, which was overwhelming to Simon. And then Peter, or Jesus famously asked him, come with me. If you'll come with me, I'll make you fishers of men. Interesting choice by Jesus. A gentleman that had no special education, no great wealth, no great social standing, just seemingly a very ordinary person. But look at this ordinary life that would be able to go and experience extraordinary things with Jesus. Extraordinary things. Seeing the blind healed. Seeing Jesus perform all these miracles, experiencing firsthand the magnetism that was Jesus Christ. People were following him. They just wanted to touch him. They wanted to see him. They wanted to hear him. They just wanted to be close to him. This ordinary man named Jesus. So Peter has got to experience all these things firsthand. And over my over my many years of going to various churches and hearing various sermons about Peter, sometimes I've heard, many times, Peter's faults that are explored through sermons because Peter famously made some. That's nice, some. And a lot of times in these sermons, it is really explored of not what to do. Don't be like Peter. And today, I would like to introduce to you that Peter, this walk in his shoes, that he was just an ordinary man that experienced fantastic things, got to see these things, and the irony later on of what would happen. After experiencing many things and miracles with Jesus, we come to this passage where Jesus famously changes his name from Simon to Peter. And the significance of this change, as Peter, when translated, literally means rock. The rock, rocky, stone. Every translation, basically it means the rock. And with Easter, just so short ago, and the many events leading up to the death and resurrection of Christ, fresh in our mind, we think a moment about what Peter went through after experiencing these wonderful things. Remember, we're in his shoes. Let him be real today. Let him be a real man that walked around in color, that could see and hear and feel just like we do. Peter was a real man. Famous as, famously, as we move to the Last Supper, as it's called, and Jesus is speaking and tearing the bread and sharing the wine. As we are Peter, and we're thinking from Peter's perspective, this seems weird. What is going on here? What is Jesus talking about? This is my body. This is my blood. Later in the conversation, Jesus would tell that he had a, someone that would betray him right among, in their midst. This too for Peter would be very confusing and alarming. And then, of course, Jesus famously turns to Peter and says, I tell you that before the cock crows that you will deny me three times times and we as Peter say Jesus I, I will never betray you I'll be right there with you 
no matter what. Well, we know that, G, that later on that Simon would, in fact, do exactly as Jesus predicted. But however, at the time when he is told that he would denounce him three times, perhaps the experiences that we have went through as Peter and seeing all these miracles actually made us believe that we would never be in a situation that Jesus couldn't handle it. We had felt as though we were backing the right guy, the man of God, the son of God, man of God. We couldn't foresee the events that were getting ready to happen. Then later on that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, as they come to take Jesus away and arrest him, someone, there's four Gospels, one of the Gospels said it's Peter himself that withdrew a sword and cut off the ear of a soldier. And Jesus famously picks up the ear and puts it back on his face and tells his people to stand down. Basically, we are not going to be using violence. And we as Simon Peter, again, we are confused and we run away and scurry away because we don't know what's going on this whole night has been very, very unusual indeed. We do not know what's going on and we want to run away and we see that Jesus submits to being arrested peacefully. This doesn't make any sense. As powerful as this man is, why is he doing this? Where is my place in this? This is not going the way we thought it was going to go. Our king has been arrested and is giving himself up. He's not using any of his power that we, we know he's got it. We know the power of Jesus. Don't know what to do. As they have taken Jesus to Caiaphas, the high priest... We, Peter, try to follow along. We want to know what's going on. We don't know what to do, but we want to know what's going on. So we follow along the best we can. Try to hide our face. And the scriptures tell us as we're getting into the hallway that we're trying to get a glimpse of Christ, our friend, that a little girl says, you're with him. And you're like, oh, no, 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 I'm not with him. No, I'm not with him. Still closer, you're trying to get, and you're trying to catch a glimpse of your friend. And someone else says, you're from Galilee. Definitely I've seen you with him. And once again you say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not with him. Inching closer still to get a glimpse of the Christ, our friend, and we finally do. And at that moment, someone turns and says, he is one of his apostles. I have definitely seen him with him. And of course, at that moment, things happen. You lock eyes with your Savior. And you also say, no, I'm not with him. And at that moment, you hear that rooster crow. And you know that you have failed and run away. It happened. We denied him three times. Sure did. Out of utter fear, a life or death decision, and we've made the wrong one. Things have unfolded and spiraled out of control of which events we could never have foreseen. So yes, it's preached a lot about Peter denying Christ three times and it's not a good idea we know however how many times have we denied him three ten a hundred times have we denied him not exactly sure where Peter went but we can be sure that he went and hid as the trial was going on the next day of all these events that are fresh in our mind, 
We don't know, but we figure that he was probably pretty close, and we don't know. Could he hear the cries of an angry mob crowd that said, Crucify him! Crucify him! Every bit of these things adding to our own failure and anguish and not knowing what to do as Peter. As we all know, Christ was raised from the dead and the news spread quickly. And Peter at first didn't believe it. And then as Jesus revealed himself and he heard that he was truly resurrected, if you're Peter and you've went through these events, you can probably imagine that he was saying, oh yes, oh no. He lives, but I've denied him. I have failed. I am not the rock that he said I would be. We're not sure how many days that this went on, but some theologians believe it's around 60 days that the apostles were in hiding and running and not knowing what to do, not knowing their place, but knowing that they were failures of the Christ. And that leads us to our next scriptures that are going to talk about that Peter decided finally to go back to what he knew. And this comes from the living word, the gospel of John, chapter 21, 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, as called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out immediately, got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any food? They answered to him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Sounds familiar. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came into the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than thee? Peter said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? 
And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter was restored that day. He was commanded to feed the sheep. Did he do it? The scriptures say that he went out and preached and preached the word of a living God of the Christ. There were still a few bumps along the way. We are Peter, after all. We make a few mistakes. However, there was one mistake we wouldn't make again, and that is to deny Christ. You see, every year Easter needs a little more to me. Before the resurrection, Peter would deny. After the resurrection, we know we can tell. Peter believed who he was talking to. He believed who was commanding him to go out and feed his sheep. He believed. As he would take it all the way to his grave, no longer would he deny his last request as he was getting ready to be crucified was that he be crucified upside down because he was not worthy to die as his Savior had. Did he feed the sheep? Interesting. That Rome would play a hand in Jesus' death. That in somewhere around 316 A.D., coincidence, I don't know, that Roman Emperor Constantine would convert the Roman Empire to Christianity. And that now sits in the Vatican City today, considered one of the holiest places on earth, is St. Peter's Basilica, the Vatican City. And if you were to look up, you would see some words, and these words are, are inscribed. And they are, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. To you I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus took an ordinary man and did extraordinary things, yet he still messed up. And Jesus forgave him and still did more extraordinary things. We see that Peter followed the commandments. First, he loved God. He loved Jesus. And he fed the lambs. He fed the sheep. But today, we must ask ourselves, where are the sheep today? Are they in this church? Are they far away? too far for us to get to and help? Are they too far away? Are they a little bit closer, maybe in our county, in our city? Are they at the gas stations where we get gas? Are they at the grocery store where we buy groceries? Closer still, are they our friends, these sheep? Closer still, are they in our families? I ask you today, do you love him? Please, feed his sheep. 
Our hymn of commitment today is number 267. And if anyone has any prayer needs, would like to come down to the altar for any reason, you're welcome to come. Again, I want to thank you so much on behalf of me and my wife for welcoming us so much today. Hear these words of benediction. Father God, well, just a second, please. I want to say thank you, Sammy, for being with oh. us today. We, we kind of talked about that, but it, it's okay. Um, I failed to mention at the beginning of the service that our pastor, Ryan, has officiated a wedding in Virginia, and that's where he and family are today. And uh, just so that you'll be aware that he's there. And Sammy was gracious to fill in for him. Benediction is yours wow. now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Eddie. Yes, if y'all are new here, I am not the pastor here. And indeed, a wonderful man, Pastor Ryan Clore is. So please come back and visit with Pastor Ryan Clore. Hear these words of benediction. Father God, we thank you so much for allowing us to worship in your house today. We pray that you would guide us, Father God, as you are the teacher and you are the good shepherd, that you would teach us in every way of how we are to teach tend your flock, and also be your sheep. Please go with us and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.